and aware of God's presence. Here, now. Lord, show us your ways and teach us your paths. Make known to us the path of life. In your name, amen. I've already told you all that after years of searching, or at least those of you that were fortunate, unfortunate enough to hear my two sermons uh, back in the end of June, that I, I finally found what I call my spiritual home in Celtic Christian spirituality. And some of the highlights of that are, are we worked up a fact sheet, and that's on the back by the uh, offering plates there and on the sign -in, old sign-in table there. If you want to know more about what it is that, that, that seems to me be the essence of, of, of Celtic Christian spirituality. And one of the most fascinating of the Celtic figures is, is St. Aidan. Uh, and, and we're fortunate that Venerable Bede in the 700s wrote a lot about St. Aidan of Landisfarne, who lived in the 600s. Uh, Aidan was an inspiring figure, especially in contrast to today's rapid pace, a hurry, scurry world which too often involves relational shallowness. Aidan was a, an Irish monk, a missionary in the 600s. He ministered in northern England and, and southern Scotland where he lovingly led them out of their Anglo-Saxon paganism into faith in Jesus Christ. He had an incredible impact upon a whole region of this world. He made as his home the island of Landisfarne on the eastern shore of, of, of northern England, now known as the Holy Island, and there should be a picture of that coming up. He served as its first bishop, uh, spreading the gospel to everyone regardless of what their social status was, whether they were king or whether they were nobility or whether they were slaves, whether they were young or whether they were old, whether they were peasants or whether they were children. His gentle, polite, friendly, and very, very relational style was a forerunner to, I guess, what we call friendship evangelism. Uh, I, this month in the Celtic Daily uh, Prayer Book, uh, in the evening, we're studying Aden. And here's a letter that somebody wrote in the 600s uh, to the king. He said, I am, no, it's by King Oswald. I am Oswald, king of Northumbria. I already knew Aden before he came here. He was a young monk when I was a boy in exile on Iona. He moved here. I had been bitterly disappointed when another person had come and, and left to my our island of North Landisfarne. So when Aidan and his monks arrived, I said, Thank God you've come. I'll, I'll give you any bit of land you choose for the monastery. I'll help you in any way I can. Just call on me. But that's because he came and converted Oswald to Christianity. And a, another person uh, wrote that I am a British Christian. My family were Christians when Ireland was still pagan darkness. I belong to the ancient church of this land. I didn't like the thought of this Irish missionary upstart. I thought he was a puppet of the English king whom I hate. When I saw him coming down the lane, I would have passed by in silence, but something about him, something in the way he looked at me made me stop, and he asked, Are you a Christian? He asked it gently. Of course, I said huffily, Th That's good to hear. Now, will you try to be a better one? <laughs> 
I, he, he just had this infectious way of sharing his love for God because of who God is and what God had done for him and sharing it with others. Today, Aiden is officially recognized. It's A-I-D-A-N. He's officially recognized as a saint in the Anglican Worldwide Church, in the Roman Catholic Church, and in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And he made his eventual home in Landisfarne. And you may have heard me talk about Landisfarne. It's a tidal, T-I-D-A-L, a tidal island. It's an island when the tide is in, but it's connected to the mainland by a causeway when the tide is out and low. It, there's a natural rhythm because of that tide, ebb and flow of the tides. There's a natural rhythm of Landisfarne, and it's a spiritual rhythm, rhythm, and it's a, a spiritual rhythm that I long for in my own life. For me, that ebb and flow expresses the essence of, of Celtic way of following Jesus. I think that Alan Torrey has it right when he wrote, there is a contemplative in us all, almost strangled, but still alive, craving the quiet enjoyment of the now, longing to touch the seamless garment of silence which help make us whole. Can any of you identify with those words in this, in this era when there's just noise everywhere, distraction everywhere? You know, whether you got it in your ears or you got it in your phone or in TV sets or radios or there's just noise everywhere. And we so often miss the sense of the now, of just being, of just being with God. Well, one of the most captivating Celtic writings that I've encountered so far comes from the pen of, of Aden. I want you to grasp the smooth rhythm of Landisfarne through Aden's piercing and penetrating words. These are words that I think capture the need of the human heart. Leave me alone with God as much as may be. As the tide waters close in upon the shore, make me an island set apart, alone with you, God, holy to you. Then with the turning of the tide, prepare me to carry your presence to the busy world beyond, the world that rushes in on me, till the waters come again and fold me back into you. There's a need for us to have a more God-grounded simplicity in our lives. My soul seeks that land us for an ebb and flow of God's nurture and my service. God's nurture and my service. God's nurture and God's nurture. This is the heavenly rhythm that we see in Jesus. Jesus went from place of prayer to place of prayer, teaching eternal truths and working miracles in between. That's the rhythm of life in in Acts 2 as well. David's been having us spend some time in Acts 2 and verses 42 and 43 say, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles we too can experience some of that rhythm of stepping off the world's treadmill and into a world of peace with each other together through the life groups that David has been talking about. We can overcome the relational shallowness that just pervades our 
21st century American culture. Uh, life groups are consistent with the spirituality of Jesus, the Celts, and the early church. Philippians 2, 12, in one of those kind of question mark verses, uh, says that we're to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Well, the reality is that we need to be together to work out together what God has worked in to us. And that's what life groups are all about. Life groups can be what the Celts call a thin place, a place where God can touch you easily and deeply. It can be a time, it can be a place. Well, life groups can be that time and place that we can work out together what God has so graciously worked in. We can together discern and acknowledge and absorb that who God is and what God has, as our psalm readings declared, done so very much for us. So I'm getting ready to shift gears a little bit. Uh, this message is about God's goodness, who he is, his nature, and about what he's done for us. And I think that Aiden personifies that. So many of the Celtic saints did. But moreover, Jesus did. And Jesus has come to dwell within us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we too can experience God's goodness and be grateful for all he's done for us. Emily and I left here several weeks ago in a rush to get up to, for M to, I started to call her Little M, well, a 38-year girl, Little M, uh, was expecting her, her second child. She wasn't supposed to have children, and she's expecting her second child. So we rushed up there and and we ended up waiting 12 days before Coltrane was born. Uh, and it was a, a, a wonderful time of being with them. But I used some of that time as a thin place for me, a thin time for me to kind of take stock and summarize, at least in part, God's nature and his character. Uh, here goes my version of who God is. He's personal. He's a personal being that longs to have a personal relationship with us. And his steadfast love endures forever. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient, meaning uh, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful. And he's omnipresent and omnipotent. He's powerful. His nature is righteousness, purity, Holiness, he's wise, good, caring, just, long suffering, merciful, slow to anger, perfect, glorious, majestic, guiltless, sinless, spotless, eternal, faithful and true, and filled with loving kindness. Who is God? He's the incomparable I am who I am. God truly is an awesome God. And then I'm tempted to summarize again, at least in part, what God has done for us. First of all, out of nothing, ex nihilo, he created this world and the vast expanse of interstellar space. He offered a covenant relationship to his followers so as to bless us. He inspired the Holy Scriptures. He humbled himself, as Philippians 2 says. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Christ laid down his life for us, a painful death as a prisoner on the hard wood of the Golgotha cross. Thus, God can offer to us those who believe 
into the, well, adopt us into the family of God as his children. I, I got into it with, oh, I know, with some folks uh, last week who talked about everybody's a child of God. Everybody is a creation of God. But Scripture is very clear in about, a, about eight places that you only are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. I know it sounds good to say we're all children of God, but that's a fraud because that makes people assume without having faith in Jesus Christ that they're in God's family. And that's what Aiden and Jesus and you and I or do something about. He forgives sins. He regenerates souls. He sanctifies. He delivers from evil. He graces us with spiritual and material blessings. He comforts those who mourn. He bestows spiritual gifts and living water from the well of his essence that never runs dry. He resurrects the dead then and now and works miracles of all types. He defends. He protects. He guides. He mediates and advocates on, advocates on our behalf. He upholds all things. He is the guardian of our souls. He will be the only judge, as our gospel lesson said at the end of the age. Oh, how great the works he has done and is now doing and will do. Some of his titles are lawgiver, light of the world, life giver, Lord of Lords, author of salvation, the Savior and Redeemer of the world, resurrection and life, friend of sinners, living God, Prince of Peace, the way, the truth, and the life, the Lord God of heaven and earth, sovereign, all-sufficient God, and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. As Psalm 113, as Joel read, who is like the Lord our God? He is the unequaled, unparalleled, everlasting, supreme being of all beings. So how are we to respond? As 1 Peter 3.11 said, what sort of people ought we to be? gospel made it very clear that good works without living faith I never knew you so we're dealing with serious matters here I got a heart light yesterday that said the purpose of your life is far greater than your own pleasure and fulfillment your peace of mind or even your happiness you were born by God's purposes and for God's purposes. So let's personalize this biblical question and each give it some thought. In light of who God is, who you know him to be, and what he's done generally and specifically for you, what sort of person ought you to be? What sort of person ought I to be? Quietly think for a moment of who you are to be in Christ and what we're to do on his behalf. In light of what God has done, who he is, and I, I, I've been addressing that. And it's interesting that the two things that seem to come to the forefront of my mind are both songs. I, matter of fact, I told the, the, the worship team, they're really kind of responsible in some ways for this sermon because of one of the lines and one of the songs I heard here. They, both of these songs are... Uh, they cut to the quick, uh, at least there's a line or two in them that does, by setting for me a godly aim for my life, which I fall so far short of. 
but I know it's God's goal for me. And both remind me of the deep eternal truth that there will be a judgment day for each and every one of us, each and everybody, everywhere of all times. The first one happened in Rwanda about six weeks ago, right after I'd Right before I'd uh, taken that video of Archbishop Kalini, uh, I, I have to tell you this, because uh, you know I'm not perfect, but this just gives you a good example of it. Monica will understand what this story is all about. I go to the airport, I packed everything, I thought about everything, I, I prepared I don't know how many teachings and all that stuff, and I, I get to the airport to check in, and <laughs> I forgot my passport. Now, Randy Butler picked me up for a 7 o'clock flight about quarter to 6 or something like that. So you can imagine what time I got to the airport. I didn't have, they ain't going to let you on an airplane on an international flight if you don't have an airport. I learned that in London one time when I also didn't have a visa. Or another time I was going to Rwanda and I didn't have a passport and we were in, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So this isn't the first time this has happened. <laughs> the, the funny thing is I'd just gotten through having a, a, a memory, a standard memory test, I, you know, just to make sure I had a baseline whether I still had any sense or not, I could remember anything. And, and so I, I called Randy, who had left already, and said, Randy, you've got to go to my house and, and get my passport. I ain't going to Rwanda. I called Jason and woke the poor man up. I, you know, he gets home at like 11 o'clock at night, and every night and 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 but I woke him up and told him it was in the safe and he went over to the house and didn't have his glasses and had to undo the safe and 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 we walked through that and and Randy finally came and and handed it to me I mean I mean it, this was real I mean this was like 20 minutes before the flight was going to take off and you know they shut the doors at 20 minutes before you take off and Randy said oh I see you cheated on your memory test <laughs> Well, I made it on the flight. Monica thought I was kind of cool. I, I was t churning inside. Monica and Claude were there at the time. I hope they were praying for me. I hope y'all were praying for me because it, it did come. Well, anyway, 30 hours later of airports and, let's say, four airports and four chain planes and, and hurry up to, to wait and, uh, and, 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 and all that type stuff, I... I left on a Friday morning and I arrived on Saturday night uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Rwanda. Needless to say, I was tired and, and uh, didn't get much sleep that night. By the time I got in, I knew I had to get in the car early the next morning, drive up, be driven up to Bayumba, a bumpy road and all that to preach. And, and, and I talked about thin places early, times when you're vulnerable to God and, and God can touch you deeply. When I'm really tired, that's one of those places. I, my defense mechanisms kind of fall down and I, I, I understand my utter dependence on God and, uh, and, and this was one of those thin times. And, and, and not only that, the bishop, they had asked me to preach on righteousness. <laughs> of all things, I am not worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. <laughs> And after my message there, they sang a song. Uh, it was, I've never heard it before and may never sing it, hear it again. But uh, this is what the song said. Pastor, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus by the way you live. We are tired of your words. We want to see Jesus by how you live. Show us Jesus. I mean, there I was in that thin place. And they sing a song to the pastor. I, I, I passed this on to Bruce and, and Donnie. And uh, Bruce said, that doesn't apply just to pastors. It applies to all of us. Show us Jesus by how you live. Well, it, I mean, it wiped me out. And it reminded me of, of how much, how, how wonderful our God is. Despite all of my failings, he's gracious. 
to forgive and to love. His steadfast love endures forever. Though I hadn't heard that song but once, I'll never forget those words. I've invited to speak at a conference in Uganda next year, and, and, and it's interesting that uh, the title of it is Show Me Jesus. So, that song, Show Me Jesus by How You Live, is part of my, to be a part of my response to God. The second is another song, and it's one that we've sung here that has a line that, that also wipes me out. Uh, I, it's, a, it's a 1989 Spanish hymn, I mean Swedish hymn, but I heard, heard Don Moen sing it uh, in my car about four or five months ago when I was driving up to Meridian to just give thanks to the Lord for my parents and to stand on their grave and to worship the Lord. And I ask you to ponder these words as I close this message. I, I know my clock watch stopped, so y'all thought you were in trouble, but uh, this really is winding it down. Uh, these are the words to that song. When all's been said and done, there's only one thing that really matters. Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done, all my treasures will mean nothing. Only what I've done for love's sake and love's reward will stand the test of time. Lord, your mercy is so great that you look... I'm sorry, I just got... You look beyond our weakness and find purest gold in miry clay, making sinners into saints. I will always sing your praise here on earth and ever after. For you've shown the hev my, you've shown me heaven's true my true home when it's all been said and done. You're my life. When life is gone, when it's all been said and done, did I live my life for you? Show us Jesus by how you live. I'm tired of your words. Show me Jesus by how you live. Just show us Jesus. When all's been said and done, there's only one thing that really matters. Did I live my life for you, O oh God?